Good afternoon, John Jay. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jasmine Awad, and I'm the student body president here. I am so humbled and honored to be standing on stage today to open an event that we have been talking about for weeks. As a John Jay student, it's exciting to know that John Jay really makes the effort to ensure that students are learning outside of the classroom from different people who are fighting for different forms of justice. Just this year alone, we hosted the New York State Attorney General debates and the inauguration for Tish James. And now, we're all excited to meet Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, famously known as AOC. As a congresswoman for the 14th District of New York, Ocasio covers many, two different boroughs that many of us here call home. And I hope that many of you get to enjoy today's event and that a few of your student questions are answered. But before we do introduce AOC, it's really important to acknowledge those who have helped make this happen. Dr. Susan King is a professor in the political science department here at John Jay. She has been working here since 2008, and she has received her PhD from the University of Minnesota. Her research and teaching interests include international relations, international political economics, labor and human rights, and international law. Dr. Kang is published, has published numerous articles in various different journals on workers' rights, human rights, and social movements. Active in Queen's politics and civic affairs, Dr. Kang had the opportunity to meet Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and was able to host this event for us tonight, t t this afternoon. So now please welcome me and giving me giving a warm welcome to Dr. Susan King. Uh, hi everyone. <laughs> uh, this is amazing. I'm so pleased to see so many John Jay students here and excited um, to meet uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It seems that you've all heard of her and that's amazing. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, I had the uh, privilege and honor of meeting Congresswoman well, back then, we just call her Alex, uh, when she was a candidate back in 2017, and I met her through my work as a volunteer for the Democratic Socialists of America, and we were just hanging out, and she was also hanging out, and we realized we had a lot of shared values, and we ended up endorsing her, and I was able to knock on lots and lots of doors and break down my, the soles of my shoes, knocking on doors saying, there is a primary election on June 26, and it's very important um, that you come, and this is the candidate we're talking about, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and it was great talking to my neighbors, especially because um, like some of you in this room might also feel a little discouraged um, about politics, but to talk to my neighbors was amazing. I got my friends from all over the country to use to phone bank. Um, I had my children were able to uh, volunteer to be part of the video, um, and we all believed that this was a fight worth taking part in. We just didn't know that she would win, <laughs> and she would win so much. Um, and then we also thought that she was amazing, but we didn't know how amazing she was going to be. That as a freshman uh, congresswoman without a lot of establishment connections, she would change the discourse in Washington and change the way a lot of young people feel about the political possibilities in our country. Um, so, yeah. And so many of the things that uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez fights for really match the values of John Jay College, which is why Professor Arbor called me up and was like, hey, we should invite her to come and speak to our students. And I was like, yes, it's an amazing uh, idea. And it took a while because, uh, as you know, she's kind of a rock star. Uh, yeah, and so we're so pleased um, for, uh, she doesn't require much introduction, but to introduce you to the Congresswoman from New York, District 14. Uh, the Honorable Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Oh Hi, everyone. Hey. Oh, my goodness. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you for this incredible welcome. Oh, my goodness. It really... 
Thank you. It feels so good to be home. It feels so good every single time um, when we're, you know, going between D.C. and coming back to New York. It Coming back here always feels like coming back in that desert and you're going back to the oasis and you're taking that drink of water and then you're going back out to, to fight and, and making sure that we're getting the right things passed and the right issues um, advanced in this country. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so thankful to be here. I'm so thankful to be in your presence, everyone here's presence today, because this right here, the people that are organized in this room, each and every single one of you individually organized and put together is what is going to change the United States of America. And um, that is just one of the main things that I wanna share with each and every one of you all today is that this is not about one person getting one seat in DC. This is about each and every single one of us participating in a movement, however we are called to change this country. And uh, in some ways, you know, people say that we're trying to change our country into this radical new direction. But in some ways, I feel like we're just trying to come back home. That we're just trying to reassert and renew the values of justice, freedom, liberty, human dignity, humanity, and looking after one another. Because one of the big things that we talked about is that in this moment, and I think it's no secret that a lot of us feel that we have strayed from those values as a government, as an administration, and sometimes just as a culture. And so, um, so a lot of, of what this means to me is hope, and a lot of what this means to me is um, the idea that we can actually be engaged and excited, not just about politics, but about policy, about culture, about the conversations that we're having. That right there, this right here, this is the work and this is change. And um, I'm just really excited. I'm really excited about it. I'm feeling really good about it. Um, and I always want to kind of... Uh, I always, want, I always revisit this story because just a year ago, I have to like always remind people because it seems that when we're on TV or when you're doing this or doing that, or it's like, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, um, being on the cover of Time Magazine, it's like really surreal. <laughs> it's really surreal. And it feels awkward and uncomfortable for me to even say that. Like... Uh, that cover came out and it felt like when you go to Disney and they do the fake ones, you know? <laughs> That's really what it felt like to me. It feels, um, you know, if anyone here has heard of the term imposter syndrome, has anyone heard of it? Raise your hand if you've heard of imposter syndrome. Yeah, that's like my life, <laughs> you know? And it's hard to believe and, um, and it, it really is what I feel so often every day. It's like, I don't belong here. This magazine cover is fake. I don't know why these people are following me around. <laughs> I'm not that important. And I think it's important to share that because even, um, even in what feels like a totally surreal moment and what can look like success doesn't always feel like success. It, uh, it feels just like insanity. <laughs> and, um, and I remember 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, when my college graduation was, was coming up. Is anyone here a senior? There you go, congratulations. Anyone here first in their family on one or both sides to go to college? That's what I'm talking about. When I say that the change in this country is real, that is exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an entire generation that is changing and creating history in their own family line by being the first to go to college or being the first to start a business or being the first to express themselves creatively in a bold and courageous way. And so a year ago, I was working in Union Square. I was bartending. And... Um, 
And 10 years ago, I was a senior about to graduate college, wasn't quite sure about my future. I knew that I wanted to dedicate my life to community. I knew that I wanted to dedicate my life um, in, in that immediate term to children and to education and to organizing. Um, and I remember that I applied, there was kind of like this contest to be your commencement speaker. And I wrote a speech and I sent it in, someone had encouraged me, and I didn't get it. And, uh, and I remember it was like very, um, it was like very, he the competition was very heated. And at the very end, it was like me and maybe two other people. It was like three finalists. And, uh, and a lot, like people were really excited and all of these things. And I didn't get it. And I didn't get it. And I was sitting there and, you know, the, the winning speech was about supporting our institutions and the winning speech was about um, really like praising the way we have been doing things. And my speech was like the total opposite. <laughs> and I was like, I think I know why I wasn't picked. <laughs> and, um, and 10 years later, my alma mater asked, is like, you know, talking about uh, coming back to graduation. It's not necessarily for, for delivering a huge commencement speech or whatever, but it's like, it's, it's funny how these things come full circle because the short term feels like failure for a very long period of time. And even while I was running just a year ago, I was bartending, I was going out into my community. The very first canvas that I did was out of a Trader Joe's bag. And, uh, and I had a clipboard and some friends and, and some folks that organizers that I had worked with had just kind of mocked up a, um, a palm card uh, with my face and my name on it. And we started canvassing like a year before the primary election. And we had no idea what we were doing. We had no idea, but we're like, this, we're, gonna, we're gonna try this, we're gonna do this. And as each stage went forward, we learned about it as the step came. And it was the complete opposite of how I was taught that we need to do things. It was the complete opposite of how I was taught how you pursue success or how you pursue any big project. You know, the way that I felt we had to do things was to make sure you knew all the steps in advance. Like, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to do all this? How are you going to do that? And if you don't know every single step before you start, then don't start. That was kind of the model of how I was taught to do things. And after trying to do things that way for so long and feeling discouraged for so long, I had just kind of tossed up my hands and said, we don't have time to wait right now with where we are as a country. We don't have time to wait for someone to descend from the heavens and give us the entire blueprint that's scoped out from step zero to step 100. We just need to start and we'll figure it out on the way and we'll find our mistakes and we'll correct them and we'll iterate on them and we'll do them better next time. But that is what evolution actually looks like. And you just take that as far as you possibly can. And, um, and that real success is not about, it's, it's not about not making a mistake, but it's about acknowledging your mistakes, not doubling down on them, and correcting them, and transitioning out of them. And so that's what we did. And so my first canvas, which Dr. Kang was a part of, she brought her sons, and a lot of other people in the community came out, and, um, and for months, I just took this Trader Joe's bag. It was like a grocery bag for like the first six months. And then I graduated to a little like carrito that like <laughs> people, <laughs> you know, like you're going to the laundromat or something. Um, so I went from the Trader Joe's bag to the carrito. And then eventually we'd like uh, rent like a car to go or a zip car or whatever. We were going, you know, across boroughs and things like that. And... Um, and I, I, I think it's just important to revisit those stories because, you know, it's uh, like Beyonce came out with her documentary last night, right? And uh, <laughs> I'm still itching to watch it, but I did see one clip where, where one of the things that she talks about is that like no one sees what that dirty work looks like. No one sees what that sacrifice looks like. And 99% of it is is that 99% of it feels like 
I don't know if this is working. 99% of it feels like you're tired. 99% of it feels like discouragement sometimes. But uh, I always kind of go back and think about this, this other quote from former President Theodore Roosevelt, where he talks about the man in the arena and that it is not the critic who counts. It's not the person who's sitting in the audience pointing at the mistakes that you're making. It is the person in the arena whose face is marred with dirt and sweat and blood who decides to valiantly try again and again. And I think that there is no stronger ethos from our communities when we're first generation, when we're women, when we're people of color, when we're immigrants, that it's, it's not about executing because we've been groomed from the time we were born about the right way to do everything. It's that we are just relentless and we learn that from our parents and we learn that from our families and we learn that from so many different people. You know, I grew up with, uh, with family, some, were, some of whom were, you know, they're on both sides of that blue line. I have family that served in, uh, in the NYPD. I have family that were detectives. I have family that were caught in the criminal justice system. But all of, all of that is part of our entire city story, entire, our entire family story. And you learn what that resilience looks like whether it's being the first in your family to do something or whether it's getting up and rehabilitating yourself after you've been locked up in a system. All of that is what persistence and resilience and a commitment to self-improvement looks like. And, um, and I'm just excited to kind of sit down and, and pursue this conversation with you all. But that grounding ethos is the core behind all of the policies that we advance. Because we're in a very critical time, I think, as a society and as a country. Forget the negative parts, you know? Forget this, like, forget the Mueller report. Forget all of that. That is a critical tipping point, absolutely. But here I want to talk a little bit about our positive tipping points. Because one is that I think that one of the things that we're reckoning with right now is that with the evolution of technology and with the... Uh, with with the evolution in our systems and our elevation in our collective consciousness as a culture is that uh, we are realizing that we are kind of outgrowing a zero-sum society. Um, because of the amount of technology that we have, because of the way that we're doing things, what happens when some things are not scarce anymore? What happens when we actually do have the technological capacities to feed every single person in the world? And I think these are the challenging questions that we are dealing with right now as a society because uh, we do have the capacity to clothe every child and feed every hungry person, but we do not have the systems and the distribution of resource that is prepared for that advancement in our technology. I think those are some of the core questions that we have, you know, especially when we have conversations about immigration. And people say, well, how are we going to fit all of these people? We don't have, like, what is gonna happen? It's this idea that there is not enough when we aren't matching that to the reality that there's a labor shortage in this country. There aren't enough people to fill jobs in critical industries, whether it's high skill, whether it's meatpacking, whether it's construction, whether it's new technology, there are vacancies. And, um, and, but we're so tied to this idea of zero sum. We're so tied to this idea that there is not enough. But due to our evolution as a society, we're in, in certain specific areas that we are starting to depart from that reality. And so those are the questions that I think we're gonna have to wrestle with. Those are the questions that we're gonna have to answer for our generation and generations to come. And that at its core is why we believe that we need to evolve our idea of what human rights look like. That is why I believe healthcare is a right, education is a right, that we have access to clean water is a right, that, um, that these are part of a second economic bill of rights. And that is not an idea that I came up with. That is an idea that was established by the President of the United States in the 1940s with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Delano Roosevelt presented the second economic bill of rights, which include a right to a job, a right to dignified retirement, 
a right to health care. And these were things that we started to recognize were possible 80 years ago. And so really what I think we're charged with doing is challenging the limitations of our past thinking and realize and try to advance what a good and just and innovative America looks like for the 21st and 22nd centuries. So I just kind of want to leave you with that and I'm excited for us to come out and have this conversation. So thank you all very, very much. so much for being here. We're really grateful. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Raven Reed. I'm a political science major and also a senior, so yeah. <laughs> and I'm so honored to be here to be answering your guys' questions. So the first question I have is from a student named Aida Alumri, who is a political science major as well. And she says, what inspired you to run for Congress in your district? Um, I think it was, a, it was a combination of a lot of different factors. One, the first, one of the first seeds that was planted that I didn't even realize was being planted was years ago. Uh, after I graduated college, I moved back to the Bronx and I was doing education organizing. And I remember looking up and, and uh, looking up who my congressman was when I moved back. And I remember looking that up and seeing it, and I was like, who is that, you know? <laughs> and I remember that being the flag, right? Because, it, you know, it's this common thing where people say, oh, like, you don't even know who your member of Congress is. And as though that is shameful for us, right? As though, like, you're not doing your job as a citizen if you don't know who your member of Congress is. And it's a, I think it's a, more of a two-way relationship where we have a responsibility of looking that up you know, look it up, know who your member of Congress is, but also if you've never seen this person, if you've never heard from this person, if this person is not around, how can you also just uniquely and unilaterally blame your community for not knowing a person who isn't present? And so I remember looking up my member years ago and I was like, who, like what, like who is that? But then it, you know, the moment passed and I, I continued doing my work and I was like, okay. And then um, when the 2016 election came about, it wasn't just, it wasn't just the presidential election. It was actually a few months prior I had begun. I, I was an organizer in the Bronx for Senator Sanders in his 2016 primary campaign. And I remember knocking doors and, uh, and really feeling like no matter who won this presidential election, Congress is jacked up and our Senate is jacked up. And you could elect the best person in the world to the presidency, but if your other two major bodies are compromised, whether they're Republican or whether they're just controlled by corporate interests, you're not going to get anything done. Um, you can elect the most liberal person in the world, the most conservative person in the world. You could elect the person who matches your ideas perfectly as, pres as president. Nothing is going, that will not, that vision will not be realized unless more people run for office. And so that's when I first started thinking about it. Then, uh, the, then uh, 45 got elected and I was like, we're in trouble. <laughs> and, um, but even then, I didn't decide to run in that moment. I, I doubled down in my activism. That was my personal response. So I went to Standing Rock. I stood um, with the Lakota Sioux and indigenous tribes. And that's when, that to me was the tipping point um, because there is really something to be said for bearing witness when it comes to activism. There is something to be said for actually going to Rikers. There's something to be said for actually going to the border, for actually visiting native reservations, for actually having lived experience or a personal experience in NYCHA. There, there is really something to be said for seeing and smelling and tasting and breathing this entire experience and you actually really internalize what these issues are. And so when I was at Standing Rock, standing and looking face to face with a privatized kind of 
it, I, I don't even want to call it a private security corporation because this was like very military. Like these people had tanks, you know, and it was a private corporation. And um, standing face to face with that, with, with uh, you know, indigenous people who just wanted the same rights to their own land that anybody else had, uh, I, it really internalized the intersection of racial, economic, and criminal justice into one. And I felt like we had to do something. And that's when I decided to run. Thank you. <laughs> Congresswoman first of all, thank you again for coming and sharing your time with our students here. I'm Professor Arbor uh, from the Political Science Department. <laughs> that's my US Congress class in the second row, and they're excited. Oh, awesome. Hey, guys. <laughs> and they're very excited that someone who actually knows something about Congress gets to talk to him today, as opposed to Mondays <laughs> and Wednesdays. Uh, the question I have for today. <laughs> You probably know more than I did, especially going in. <laughs> uh, the, question, uh, the question I have is from Aura Soto from the Political Science Student Association. Uh, what are the steps you're taking to fight housing inequalities in your district? And do you believe the government should be doing more to prevent landlords from leaving low-income families on the streets? So this is a huge, huge, huge issue. So one thing that I think is really important when we talk about housing is that housing I don't want to say like the most, but definitely more, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the most, than a lot of other issues is that it is an integrated issue between all levels of government. And so the thing is, is, um, is and I'll get into some of the th work that we're doing on the federal level, but especially when it comes to housing, uh, some of the most important fights happen at the local level and it's in the boring stuff that they tell you not that they tell you is like not as engaging or what have you but it's in your community board when they're voting on zoning changes it's in your city council member when they're voting on land use it's in your state uh, assembly and Senate when they talk about uh, MCI's major capital improvements, which are these loopholes that landlords use to raise your rent $300 over X period of time. A lot of, how, a lot of our most pressing housing issues that impact our lives immediately and the most happen at a local organizing level. And, um, and you know, people, for example, take Amazon, right? Everyone thinks that, like, I'm the one who kicked out Amazon. <laughs> like, I, which I wish, in a way, I wish that's how it worked. Like, I wish my five tweets defeated the richest man in the world. <laughs> I would love to gas myself up and think that. <laughs> but uh, it was really what I, what I did and the, the role that I played, that I was proud to play, was to amplify the existing work of organizers and grassroots coalitions on the ground, which Dr. King was very much a part of. And so, the, the real people who are doing this work, especially in our, our district, are grassroots coalitions like Queens Neighborhoods United, like DSA, like, um, you know, like many, many different organizing groups. On the federal level, there are some things that we have been doing. Um, but they, they are very difficult when we're talking about getting a majority of support when the real estate industry has captured a lot of people's votes with the money, with the role of money in politics. Um, but so one of the things that, we're, that we do is uh, we've called a lot of attention to a major tax cut uh, specifically for foreign real estate developers that was made about three years ago. It actually came, well, it came from New York City and, uh, and, um, and it, it was a big issue in my race because it was introduced by my predecessor. And it was a major tax cut uh, for foreign real estate developers. And what it did was that this like huge rush that we see of these kind of shadowy LLCs funded by millionaires or billionaires from outside of New York City where they'll buy a whole brownstone or they buy a whole building and they don't even live in it and they just like, uh, they, they take it for market value and then uh, a lot of times the rents get raised in an area as a result. And that has to do with federal tax code um, because we're making it easier for that to happen on a financial basis. So we call attention to that. And uh, housing is a lot of the focus of the work that we've been approaching in, in my role as, as a member of the Financial Services Committee. 
And so we call a lot of attention to the, the, the federal uh, rule changes that have been happening on that level to make it, to make gentrification supercharged, not just in New York City, but in Detroit, in Austin, in San Francisco, all over the world. But uh, again, I cannot reiterate enough the role of state and city politics when it comes to housing. Um, we're calling a lot of attention to NYCHA as well. That has a lot, I mean, but on the federal level, um, the federal level is very slow moving. And to get that immediate change, we need to focus on city council and the state assembly. And a lot of what we try to do is amplify the work of the organizers doing that important work. Um, all right, so our next question is from Prabjot Kaur from our honors program. And it's an, a great question. Um, what can women or young girls do to prepare themselves for a career field dominated by mostly men? And what advice do you have for women trying to join these types of fields? Yeah, it's a really good question. <laughs> well, so um, before, right before this class got sworn in, Congress was 80% male um, and 20% female. Uh, in this new class and in this incoming Democratic caucus, um, in the Democratic caucus, we are now 60% women, people of color, and LGBT. <laughs> which is amazing. But even the Democratic caucus, that's still 50%. The other 200 odd or so members, give or take, depending on, on which Congress you're in, on the Republican side, out of almost 200 members, they have only elected 13 women. And um, I really feel for those women, even though they're on the other side of the aisle, because it, it has a huge impact in your work. Um, and so when I think about how to prepare yourself, um, when I first started running, I met with a woman uh, by the name of Ruth Messenger. Ruth, uh, everyone's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Ruth Messenger was the first a candidate for New York City mayor who was a nominee from a major party. She was a Democratic nominee for mayor. And, um, and she ran against Rudy Giuliani, and she had lost. But, when, but I spoke with her, and, and she's a big deal because not only was she just the first uh, woman to be nominated to, to such a stance, but she also shared my politics in many ways. And so... Um, it's hard just being a woman in that space, but it's harder when you're actually centering women and people of color and gender non-conforming people um, because it's, it's almost easier if your politics are a little different, I, I think, sometimes. Like, it's easier if you are a woman, but you're not a feminist, you know? And, uh, and so, and so on. And so I think one of the, th and one of the things that, that Miss Messenger told me in that first conversation. And first of all, it tells you the importance of that because she sat down and had breakfast with me when I was nobody. She sat down and took the time out of her morning and she, you know, she's done amazing, incredible things and she's this remarkable person and, uh, and this fighter for justice. And I was just this girl from nowhere that wanted to do this crazy thing and challenge one of the most powerful people in the United States, especially in the Democratic Party. And, um, and she actually said, okay. And actually like took the time to have breakfast with me. And so first of all, that tells you a lot about how important it is to have women in politics and in positions of power. So that's the first thing. Because when people, there's just something about seeing yourself in a younger person that just gives you, just makes you more open to giving that person a chance. And that's why it's important to have a diverse Congress. That's why it's important to have hijabi women, trans women, people of color, immigrants, etc. Because when you have that diversity, then you are able to empower perspectives that have traditionally not been empowered. And so, um, so that's one. But in terms of my side, the thing that she had told me was, you need rhinoceros skin. 
And she said, grow your rhinoceros skin. And she told me that a year, you know, a, over a year out. And I think that that is a, a big part of what we need to do. Like, we need to figure out, I think, a big part of the being a woman and trying to ascend into a very male-dominated space is learning to grow that really thick armor without losing your humanity. Because you want to be tender and tough at the same time. Because if you lose your tenderness, then you lose everything that makes you special. You lose your advocacy, you lose your empathy, you lose your compassion, and you lose a lot of the assets, I think, that make being a woman or a queer person valuable, a valuable perspective and a valuable alternative perspective. So I think a big part is to like really learn to be tough. Be tough, but don't be defensive. So two very different things. Let, let the person get it out. You know, if someone's upset at you, if someone's dismissing you, let them get it out. You know, learn how to not let it impact you and to just stay focused on your goal. It doesn't mean fighting everyone at every step of the way, but it also means learning which fights to pick. Um, and even though it looks like I'm fighting every single day, <laughs> Trust me, for every fight that I'm having, there are 10 that I choose not to have. Mm -hmm. So um, I would definitely say, like, grow that toughness, but protect your tenderness. So the next question comes from Kennedy Zamora, who says, how can Congress help graduate students with student loan debt crisis? This is huge. <laughs> I still have student loan debt, um, and uh, and a lot. I mean, a lot of members do. I think first of all, it, one way that we can do it is being honest about it. Like, why don't we talk about this? I I often say I have no problem saying you know I have student loan debt. I have no problem. That's the first step um, because. When we try, especially when it comes to financial and economic justice, we have been taught that poverty and debt are things to be ashamed of and things to hide. And in all issues of justice, you know, I think this is a big thing that we learned, you can actually learn from the LGBT community as well, is that when we are taught to be ashamed about parts of our lives, that is the number one defense against uh, people who are committing injustices from being held to account. Because if you don't talk about who you are and yourself and the fact that you're taking up space in society, then people are just gonna assume you don't exist and that your problems are not a real problem or that your rights are, are a marginalized right. And so, uh, so, you know, obviously there's, these are two very radically different uh, uh, fights, but in a lot of ways it's in this more universal fight for justice, you learn these patterns and commonalities. And so, um, so when it comes to student loan debt, the first thing is being honest about it, you know, as members. But the second thing, you know, my, my platform includes federal student loan forgiveness. Um, and it, this is not like a pie in the sky thing, and this is the narrative that always comes out from the right. This, this is unrealistic, this is this, this is that. For the, the cost of the GOP tax cut that was passed in 2017, we could have forgiven every single student loan in America. Every single one. So the question is not about possibility. It is not a question of possibility. It is, a poss it is a question of priority. And what they told us is that billionaires are more important, a handful of billionaires are more important than educating our entire populace to the level that our economy demands. And so what we want to do is have these conversations, build those demands from the ground up, to vocalize that, you know, if each, you have to understand how powerful, I, it is my belief that individual people in many ways are not, like we are at our most powerful than we have been 
in, I think, human history. Like the power of an individual is at its peak. And a lot of that has to do with technology and social media because I think that radical ideas are, ha, are starting to become mainstream at a faster clip than at almost any other point. Because before technology, you would go, someone would go into a library, you know, read bell hooks, read Noam Chomsky or whatever, and then like you have conversations at a dinner table and it's like five people, right? And then you like, you organize five people. But then guess what? Like you read that same thing or you hear someone articulate it in a podcast or you do what you have and then you tweet it and you IG it and then all of a sudden your whole block is like, what? And it's even more. And so we're actually able to organize at mass in a scale and we take it for granted, but it's really incredible how quickly we can elevate our consciousness in such a short period of time. And so, um, so one thing that I would say is, even if, you just, if you, even if you take one action today and one of those actions is to walk out of this room and to say, did you know that for the price of the GOP tax cut, we could have forgiven every single student loan in America, and it probably would have had an accelerated positive impact on our economic growth than that did. Um, it's, not about, it's, it's not about wealth distribution. It's not about taking from one person and giving it to another. It's about investment, because investments yield returns. Because if I forgive, if I invest in you, if I invest in your financial ability to go to college, or if I forgive your debt and I, I kind of invest in that retroactively, that means, guess what? That, that is a burden that is lifted that you can use to start a business, to start a family, to buy a house, to, to move on with your life. And a, a huge part of the system that we're trapped up in is all about creating debt traps so that you are stuck in this rote place in your life. And I think one of, the, one of the more transformational things that we could do is forgive student loan debt along with other, you know, the economics is the way we implement the justice. So, uh, so whether it's a question about reparations, whether it's a question about the Green New Deal and fixing the pipes in Flint, whether it's a question about federal student loan forgiveness, you have to understand that these like corporations and the very, very 1% enjoy at scale the types of subsidies that we propose and are called pie in the sky on an everyday basis. Uh, the next question comes from Tyra Stewart, one of our, one of our students here. Is that you? Hi! <laughs> and Tyra asked, though as loud as she is, she could ask it from over there, uh, what's your stance on the current incarceration policy surrounding juveniles, and will you help to shed a light on our country's injustices surrounding black, black and brown or merely economically deprived juveniles? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is huge. Um, there are so many ways. I mean, where do you even start, right? It's... Uh, the United States incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. We call ourselves the land of the free, yet we lock up more people than any other nation in the world, including China, which has a much larger population you know, than, than we do. And when, and when we talk about the proportionality at which we incarcerate in per capita, uh, we choose to, to lock up more people. And so um, a lot of it, I think, has to do with a paradigm shift. And I said this recently, too. I, I tweeted this out. And like a lot of things I, I uh, tweet out, people got mad. Um, <laughs> but we were looking at how um, these folks that, that got charged in Operation Varsity Blues, um, where they were charged with paying off folks and having this whole bribery scheme to get their kids into prestigious colleges and universities. And one of the people that was implicated in this is, is like in negotiations to get zero to six months for her role in that. And um, I say this over and over again. I said this with this and I say it with, uh, and I said it on financial services. I said it to the CEO of JP Morgan Chase right there to him 
that in my district, I represent kids that get locked up because they don't have money for a Metro card. And... And I asked him, asked him after saying that, I asked him, do you think your colleagues should have gone to jail for precipitating a crisis that took seven, that cost 7.8 or 7.6 million foreclosures in the United States of America? And he said, you'd have to talk to a legal expert about that. And I don't think I need to talk to an, a legal expert. I think I need to talk to someone with a moral compass that tells you if something, if that's off. And, um, and so uh, when it comes to our juvenile detention, and like I said with, with this situation with Operation Varsity Blues, is that we need to realize that the way that our criminal justice system has been structured is is less about delivering justice sometimes, when you look at the proportionality of our sentencing and, and the way our court system works, and that it's actually functioning as a class enforcement system. Because the poor get locked up more for crimes that are not as damaging than the rich do for mass, massive schemes of fraud that harm millions of people. And so I think there's a lot of things, and it's, it's really hard because it is systemic. A lot of it has to, goes back to education funding. The fact that your property taxes, that local property taxes fund a local school system, which causes the rich to want, run away from the poor, from the white to run away from the black, from the documented to run away from the undocumented. Um, that system, that is the impact of our education system and how we fund our schools. And so what that does is that it creates zones of poverty. And then we have a criminal justice system that criminalizes poverty with jail time and all this other stuff um, that separates families, uh, not just in, at our border, but in our criminal justice system through the criminalization of poverty. So there's a lot of things. I think when it comes to our criminal justice system, though, I believe that you know, we, you have policy assessments that say that about 40% of the people locked up in America right now do not have to be locked up. You know, they're incarcerated for nonviolent crimes, crimes of poverty, and so on. And so a lot of it has to do with a greater, uh, a greater agenda of prison abolition. And, um, and when it comes to juvenile detention, we have a school to prison pipeline. And I think that one of the main ways that we address juvenile detention is by, stop, by stopping policies that treat schools like mini jails. That like if you get in trouble, if you're a ki no kindergartner, no first grader should ever be suspended. Like, are you kidding me? They should not be, like the idea that you're suspending an eight-year-old or a seven-year-old, those are the behavioral, that's where it starts. That's where juvenile detention actually starts. And so a lot of it has to do with um, changing our policies in schools. And then it comes to the fact of, of not, of the idea of punishment always being a sentence and always being detention, I think needs to be changed. And uh, we need to include, and I think even when, when people do wrong things, I think oftentimes, especially when you're young, the way that you can change that around is through service and through community. Um, and so I think that these are, these, these are a, a part of a, a bigger system, but you know, when it comes to detention, juvenile detention and mass incarceration, that's just the bucket of, from which we hold all the people that we have thrown away or decided to dispose of. But so the question is not only like, what do you do with this bucket? The question is, why are we disposing communities? Um, so I think that, that it, it is systemic. And so a lot of the things we have to do is changing our, our system, changing mandatory minimums and, and all of that. So. Uh, this next question is from Alex Virasamy from the Honors Program. 
Uh, so you've expressed that it is your goal to end prison privatization. First, what tangible steps are you taking as a policymaker in order to reach this goal? And secondly, what tangible steps should we be taking as student activists to reach this goal? Great question. Um, so when, when, with all of these questions about like, what are you doing? Um, there's, <laughs> it's, no, it's a good question. Um, with all these questions about what are we doing, um, it's the way I think about how we do things, it falls into different buckets. First is the legislative bucket. What bills have we co-sponsored? What, what have we authored? What have we introduced? Or, or what have we signed? What ideas have we signed on to others um, to, to push that change on a legislative level? The second is, what is how are you using your position, perhaps not in a legislative way, but how are you using your position to create pressure around change? And the third is, how are you how are you using your role, even not with any of that, but how are you just using your role as an activist to create change? So first, when it comes to uh, legislative change, um, one of the things that, that we've been doing is that uh, I've co sponsored and you said it changed around mass incarceration? Prison, pri prison privatization. Mass okay, and mass incarceration. So the first thing that I've done, uh, one of the first things that I've done is that I've signed on to HR 40, which is establishing the committee to examine reparations in the United States. Um, and the reason that I bring that up is because we have to recognize that our system of mass incarceration is an evolution of our system of slavery. And so, um, so that is why, that's a big reason why when people say, oh, reparations, why is this a big issue? This happened 150 years ago, as though that's not a long time ago, as though like, as though that, that did, isn't what just happened, as though people didn't live in houses with people impacted by this. But anyways, when people try to dismiss it as an irrelevant issue, know that uh, mass incarceration evolved from the war on drugs, which evolved from Jim Crow laws, which evolved from sharecropping, which evolved from slavery. And... This is not a remedy for our past. This is about fixing something that we are living with right now today. And so uh, I've signed on to HR 40, which is Sheila Jackson Lee's bill. Um, I also, we also, I think it, this is really important, especially when it comes to questions of racial and class solidarity, is that people, you know, sometimes activists, especially activists in communities of color, they say, how do we bridge the black brown divide and all this stuff? And the way we do it is with policy is by acknowledging that these fights are united in policy. Um, and one of those things that I do is that I treat all detention the same. I Especially I treat all for-profit detention the same, which is why I do not give a dime to, D, to elevate the DHS budget so long as we are running for-profit detention centers on our border. Um, and I do, not, I do not support funding any for-profit detention, any agency with a for-profit detention budget. They, if they want to pass that budget, they can pass it without my vote. Is how I say is how I kind of approach the issue, and um, and so those were one of the legislative things, and it works because uh, when we first had the DHS budget, they wanted to first pass the, the DHS budget. Almost every single Democrat voted for the increase in that budget, and I was the only one who voted no. I was the only one in that first time because we had just found we had found sometimes. There would be riots if people found out how Congress works sometimes. And, uh, and a lot of times, like, you find things out, like, 10 minutes before a vote. Because we're literally voting on thousands of pieces of legislation, of thousands of pages sometimes of legislation in a day. And so sometimes you, like, catch something. You're like, what? So when I was the only person who didn't vote for it because we had, we had uh, seen this flagged. And it's really hard. You know, that sounds, like, easy. Like, oh, this is the right thing. Just, like... Don't vote for it, right? Um, but you literally have 400 and something odd people saying, what are you doing? And so when I first voted no, it's on a timer, right? So I didn't like wait to the end and like vote no like five minutes, five seconds before the timer ended. I voted no at the beginning. And so I got stopped so many times to change my vote. Um, but I kept it and I stayed. And you know, this is these are members of my own party, big mad, like real <laughs> mad. And, uh, and 
that's hard because there are real consequences. You know, that means that, you know, it could mean that I don't ascend to leadership in a committee, that people don't give me a chance, that like all these little things that could kind of hurt your career. Then we had to do on, this was during the middle of the government shutdown, right? So we kept like passing all of these appropriations bills and say, well, they signed this, well, they passed this. So we had like so many different chances on this. The second time it happened, I had flagged it to, uh, you know, to my homies, to Ayana, Ilhan, Rashida, and some others. And I was like, hey, we saw this, like, will you guys, you know, we, we flagged this, now we're on round two, will you join us? And they did. So then the second time, it was like four or five of us that voted no. Now, it's, so in, it, with the Democratic majority, in order to like really change things, you don't need 250 people out of you know, the 435. What you need actually is 18. Because 18 is what kills, is what swings a majority. Because Republicans are always gonna vote no. So now we vote five, yeah. <laughs> Not supposed to tell you guys that, right? <laughs> you need 18 sometimes to prevent certain things from happening. You just need 18 people. And so uh, you need a lot to pass something, but you don't need a lot to stop something. And so uh, that, now the cat's out of the bag. And, uh, and so then we got to five. And then they started getting nervous. Then they started getting nervous. But you know, it passed. They thought this time we're definitely going to reopen the government. No, nope, didn't happen. Then this bill got passed a third time. Then the, we got to vote for it a third time. And what happened? I went to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And yes, <laughs> we did. And we started coalition building just on the issue. Because, you know, everyone in the CHC may not share my politics, right? But a lot of members of the CHC do feel very strongly about this immigration issue. And so I went to two places, actually. I went to the Progressive Caucus and the Hispanic Caucus. And uh, believe it or not, it was the Hispanic Caucus, not the Progressive Caucus, which is more ideologically aligned in some ways, that turned out more. And so we were able to whip also a lot of the New York vote as well. And then that third time, we got Nidia Velasquez joined us, Adriano Espaya joined us here from New York City, a lot of folks joined us, and then we started getting to like, then we got to 16, something like that. We got real close, we got, they got real nervous. <laughs> and, um, and after that, they never brought the bill again. They did not bring that bill back in that same way. And so um, when you draw those bright lines and you do it chance after chance, you know, when you think about it, all three of those things could be messaged as a failure, right? Um, and that is where we need to dig deeper and to not listen to sometimes these overall narratives. Because all three of those times, it's like they voted to do it, it passed, you know, it went up, right? It passed the House. None of those ever got signed. And I consider that whole series a major win because we drew this bright line and now they know not to bring that again um, or else they, they risk fracturing the entire caucus. And so we drew a bright line around not you know, giving more dollars to private detention. And the second, the second part is also uh, in my committee, you know, we, I bring this up in our committee straight to bank CEOs. I went straight to Wells Fargo, and we went straight to, to uh, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase, and we brought it to them. And it was with local organizers like Make the Road New York and several other uh, immigration uh, groups, special, uh, other private uh, prison organizations as well, um, all banded together. And when you have groups like Black Lives Matter pairing up with groups like Make the Road, that is how you end private detention. It's in, those, it's in those organizing coalitions. And uh, as a result, not only did that happen on the congressional level, but in the private sector level, now two of some of the biggest banks in America, J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo, uh, these assets became too toxic for them. So now both of those banks are pulling out of investments in Geo Group and Core Civic. So we're not financing it. And 
That means that we are no that we are drawing a bright line, no for-profit detention of black and brown bodies in America. And that goes in our prison system, it goes in our immigration system, it goes in anywhere where they are locking up people for a profit. It's just unconscionable and we need to recognize that all of these things are not the same thing. I mean, all these things are the same thing and they are not competing interests, you know? I think that's one of the, the strongest ways that people fracture the left. Well, they'll say, let's talk about, uh, you know, mass incarceration. And then people will say, well, what about immigration? Don't do that. What we should see and what you should say is, this is how this impacts me. And like, just how do we use this fight to make it everyone's fight and it doesn't water down each and every individual one? Like that is what the word solidarity means. And that's how we practice it. So the last question comes from Gina Capone, who is an honor student in the political science department. Hey. Yeah, she's right there. Okay, so she asks, um, what advice would you give to students interested in running for office? That's a really good question. Um, I often, sometimes a big piece of my advice uh, is that, you know, I, I, in my work, I'm between D.C. and New York. So I spend about, in a given month, I spend about four days in D.C., and then I come back here for three days, and then one week out of the month, I'm here for, for the entire week. So it's like roughly half, but it's not distributed 50-50 the entire way. Anyways, the reason I say that is because when people ask me this question in DC, I say, get off the hill. <laughs> I, and here, what I say is essentially a similar thing in that uh, internships are important, these opportunities are important, exposure to, uh, these professional experiences. I, I myself interned for a senator when I was uh, an undergrad, but the most important experience you can have is in the community that you want to represent. And so you're not going to figure out how to best represent and advocate for your community by reading a bunch of white papers and going to Washington DC for a summer. Um, and it's not to say don't do those things, because especially in our community, when you're first gen, when you're you know navigating all these spaces, what we need to do is master the high low, right? And you can't think that the high, that the prestigious things are the things that qualify you to your community. Um, those are they're important though, like they're not things to throw away. Strive. Uh, thrive professionally, figure out these spaces, learn how to write, learn how to read, learn how to educate yourself, succeed in those spaces. But what is to say is that it is, it is not enough. And we need to have those direct experiences in our community. You need to organize with your community. You need to you know, be on that front line with your community to join. And so I guess my, my biggest piece of advice would be to join the advocacy groups in your community. Um, figure out the space, not just electorally, but in terms of advocacy and activism. Um, because it's not enough to know which levers to pull, right? It's not enough to just be on your community board or just run for office. But if you get that seat and you don't have the context of the people that you're fighting for, you're not much better than anybody else in the system. And so what you really need to do is, you can figure out those levers pretty, pretty easily, right? Like, it's not to say that, that, um, that what we did was easy. It was really, really hard. But when you know what you wanna do, you can figure it out, right? So a year ago, I was bartending. Now this whole crazy thing is happening. It's because we spent a year figuring out the levers. Okay, uh, how do we get on the ballot? Oh, we need to get all these petition signatures to get on the ballot. Like you can, those are the things you can look up. You can't look up what it feels like walking around undocumented and scared that you're gonna be separated from your family. You can't, you can't just like read about how stop and frisk impacted our communities. You can't 
just, you know, you can't just, like you can read about these things, but you need to be immersed in them to really get it, to like actually get it. And so my big piece of advice is to immerse yourself in community. And you can do all of these other things, and, and you should, but when people say like, don't forget about home, what they mean is like, it's not, it's not don't forget about these, com these experiences you had growing up. What it means is don't forget to bake this time into your everyday life on a recurring basis. Um, because even if you grew up with the craziest upbringing, it is still, you can still, it can still become this memory that becomes framed on a wall for a gallery for you to revisit. Uh, in your life, and that's not how you want to legislate. You want to, you don't want to just legislate from experiences you had 10 years ago. You want to legislate and advocate and run for office because of the conversation you had last week in your bodega. You know, that's how you stay current on these issues. And I think sometimes that's that's one of the things that we run into Congress, where there's people who who have advocated and do strong advocacy, and they're like, well, why? Are you? And and we're not. We're not trying to challenge that or disrespect that in any way, but sometimes people feel defensive about it. And it's like, it's amazing that we do these things, but it's not about a checkbox and doing it once. Is that like, is this part of your practice? The same way as, are you taking care of yourself? Are you engaging in self-care? Are you giving yourself a break? It's not, that, that was a big thing that I learned last year. Like, I took like four days off. And it's like, self-care and taking care of yourself is not about going on vacation once a year. It's about baking in that time to heal yourself every day, every other day, you know, a handful of times a week. Um, and so it's the same thing with community work and community advocate, advocacy. And I think Dr. King is like an, an amazing example of that. <laughs> Just do what she does. Just do what she does. <laughs> So that, that wraps up our Q&A, our conversation with uh, the Congresswoman. Um, just wanted to say a couple of words. Oh, did you have any closing remarks at all before I think I, I talked people? enough today. <laughs> but <laughs> no, but I think, um, and just quickly is that, again, don't forget how much power you have in this moment. Just don't forget it. Like, you have so much power. Even on our campaign, and, and Dr. Kang knows this, even on our campaign, we had young people in high school who were too young to vote. We had undocumented people. We had all sorts of people. We had people who, uh, because they didn't meet this like bogus registration deadline a year before the primary to register as a Democrat, to vote in it. By the way, uh, register to vote and check your registration to vote because you may think, you may think that you've registered and that you've registered a certain way. Trust me, you need to stay on it and you can just look it up online because it changes and you just need to stay up on it. But anyways, um, a big thing that I'd say is you have to understand how much power you have. The young people that were 16, they were going to the Board of Elections and they were double checking the petition signatures at the BOE um, because even though they couldn't collect them, we needed somebody to, to check to make sure that these signatures were valid. So they went in and did that. Our undocumented organizers were door knocking for us and talking to uh, Spanish speaking communities and organizing the community because uh, there's a lot of fear when someone you don't know knocks on your door. But when someone you do know, when you have access to these spaces, you can still organize and enact change as well. Um, there are the traditional ways that you can organize too. There's using your voice on social media and impacting um, you know, the, the amount of people that, that are listening to you. Because for so many people, you are a validator. And, uh, you know, there, there may be people that for whom my words are especially validating because of how they may see themselves connected to me. But how, but uh, even though we share some, you know, similar beliefs, maybe there are people who see themselves in Dr. Kang and she resonates with communities in a way that, or she uses certain words that resonate and the way we communicate the same message is different. And so we all have to articulate these same things in our own way because you never know who's listening to you. And trust me, people are listening to you. And so uh, all, I, all I just have to say is recognize your own power, use it, because this community and each and every one of you are just 
more powerful than your ancestors have probably ever imagined. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, my Congresswoman, I'm so uh, very proud to say. Thank you to the Office of the President and the Office of External Affairs, uh, especially Mindy Boxing, for making all this amazing and possible and run so well. Um, and uh, thank you to the uh, staff of the theater uh, for also all their work and for security, for helping. Uh, and, and of course, uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez's uh, own staff for making all this possible. And thank you, students of John Jay, who inspire us every day. Um, and you truly make my job the best job in the world. Thank you. <laughs>